I'm Jean Carroll. I work at the YWCA of Rochester in Monroe County. And I am involved in the summit because part of what we do at the YWCA, our mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. And so the summit is an opportunity to um, articulate uh, for the community what we do at the YWCA, what our mission is, and to share with the community the things that we have learned in the process of working towards eliminating racism. You were telling me that you've been doing this for like, you've been working there for like 30 years. Yes. And I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about the anti-racism work that's gone on at the YWCA? Yes. Um, you know, we've always uh, been working a lot with uh, women and girls of color and um, it was probably at least 10 years ago when all the YWCA's across the country wanted to really reaffirm our commitment to eliminating racism as part of our mission. Often people know us in terms of empowering women, mm -hmm. but they don't know us in terms of eliminating racism. So we were called upon as an organization not only to provide services to women and girls of color, mm -hmm. but to become a voice in the community for women and girls of color. And so that sent us down a road which has been quite a journey. <laughs> and for me, um, you know, the challenge was here I am, a white woman, the president of the organization, and I'm thinking, do I have credibility? Right. You know, who am I to start having this conversation about race? Mm -hmm. And so it was a challenge. And one of the things that was has been very helpful to me is a book called Witnessing Whiteness. Mm -hmm. And Witnessing Whiteness is a book that um, talks about another white woman who was an educator mm -hmm. and how she addressed her own challenges. And, um, you know, I made a lot of serious mistakes <laughs> when I was going down this road. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just a matter of having some courage having the courage to make mistakes, make blunders, you know, really screw up and learn. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, some of the things that I would do, for instance, if I was with another colleague or friend who was a person of color, is that if they said to me, oh, well, you know, they were not happy with the way they were being treated, like for instance, we'd go to a restaurant and um, somebody who came in after us, who was white, mm -hmm. uh, was seated before we were. Mm -hmm. And they would say something to me, oh yeah, look at that, you know? And I would say to them, well, you know, how do you know those people didn't like have reservations or, you know, maybe they had a table that size. And so I would always try to find excuses for white people. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I learned is that, you know, part of the process is understanding how frequent these things happen to people of color. And no, it's not, there's not a rational, you know, mm -hmm. this is not about a rational argument. This is about the history that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as white people, as a white woman, I am so used to being treated with respect mm -hmm. and with courtesy and acknowledgement. And the fact that people of color weren't being treated that way just didn't seem right to me. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it was hard for me to believe that that was really happening. So one of my learnings is when somebody who's a person of color points something out to me, I should recognize that they know better than I do. After all, they're the person without white skin. Mm -hmm. They are the person who has this experience and I should acknowledge that and not try to uh, rationalize. And that is one of the things that has been challenging. And I think it's still very challenging for many white people 
it's we don't want to you know one of the the the, the things that white people fear so much is to be called a racist because it, it's not socially acceptable it's you know when we think of an image of a racist we think of you know the kkk we think of you know uh, pickup trucks and guns and you know it's not that way now i mean there, yes it is probably in some areas, some areas right. in some areas but in general racism is much more subtle mm -hmm. often and it's something that um as a white person because you don't experience it you may not even be aware of it mm -hmm. and in fact you may in fact be doing that yourself and not even be aware that you're doing it you know so it it really is about developing a consciousness about who we are and i use the example of for many white people imagine you're a fish in a bowl of water mm -hmm. do you notice the water you don't notice the water mm -hmm. it's just part of your environment it's part of who you are you know and so people are so unconscious of their own biases and part of what witnessing whiteness is about is bringing uh, to people the knowledge of their own biases and an understanding also of um, that it's not just about them as an individual it is mm -hmm. every individual has a role to play but it's also about the place in history that we all um, are part of mm -hmm. And we cannot divorce ourselves from the history that we were born into. Mm -hmm. And the history that we were born into, you know, most people, when I talk about, you know, the beginnings of our country and issues around slavery and how slavery was really structured by the white ruling class mm -hmm. to benefit itself. <laughs> And um, most people, when I start talking about it, will say, oh, well, that, you know, phew, that was a long time ago. We're you know, that. that's, that yeah. was then, yeah. you know, we're not dealing with that anymore. You know, that's, that's like another, another world away. Well, you know, all of our laws have consistent, and our practices are really from that root. Mm -hmm. And they continue today uh, as well as you know even with you know the wonderful work that was done in the 1950s and 60s mm -hmm. to remove a lot of the legal barriers uh, to, uh, um, that, that kept people of race down. What has not happened is that the economic barriers have not changed. And so, so many people of color are still um, at a lower economic status than white people, mm -hmm. in part because they did not have the same kind of access. You know, if I think about, you know, if everyone thought about individually their own history and what their family might have done for them. Um, if your parents graduated from high school, if your parents graduated from college, mm -hmm. there is a much greater likelihood that you're going to do the same thing. And if your parents had a home and owned a home, they know how to do that. They worked hard to do it, of course, you know, but <clears throat> there's a much greater likelihood that you're going to own a home. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it is also the thing about economic equity that often if your parents grow old and they want to pass something on to you, they're going to pass along their wealth. Mm -hmm. 
And so this is not something that is just about now. It is about our, our own personal history as well as the history of our country. So part of what we do in Witnessing Whiteness is we help to build knowledge. Build knowledge of what that history is. Build knowledge of the laws. Like for instance, um, the in 1790 was the first time that there was restrictions on people of color becoming um, citizens in the United States. Mm. 1790, you know? And now we are still dealing with some of the changes in the laws. I think it was 1940 when the law changed so that if you were a person of color and you were born in the United States, you became a citizen. Mm. Um, so, but today, where we are with that is we have the dreamers, mm -hmm. the children of immigrant parents who are citizens of our country and their parents are being deported. Mm -hmm. You know, so these issues that have roots in our history and roots in our legal system um, are still with us. And so where, where are we on those issues? So I hear you talking about witnessing whiteness as sort of individually looking at our history and building that knowledge so that we have a, a basis of understanding of, you know, how racism or white supremacy has impacted not only our lives, but also our family's lives. So we can get awareness of that. Right. And then I also hear you talking about laws and you're talking about institutions. And I'm wondering if institutionalized racism also comes into that analysis or if it's more specific to uh, the individual, I guess. Oh, I think that there is substantial, uh, what I would call institutionalized or structural racism mm -hmm. that exists in our community and in our country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, um, when slaves finally were emancipated. Mm -hmm. They um, experienced a period of time of, of transition, but before too long, there ended up being other ways of restricting people of color. Mm -hmm. So we went from slavery to other restrictions on travel, restrictions on voting, and eventually to, um, you know, early Jim Crow and later Jim Crow, which Jim Crow is essentially people of color that were arrested on trumped up charges mm -hmm. and made to work for nothing. <laughs> and, you know, that whole um, prison system over the past 30 years has just, you know, multiplied. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of the whole idea of um, law and justice and is all tied up with wanting to blame someone. And automatically, because of the way that black people and uh, other people of color have been characterized as the other. Mm -hmm. You know, this is about the other, that they're not normal because they're not white. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to characterize them as being violent, to blame them for what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what happens, and it happens at a a very large rate for many people of color in our community. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the whole issues of, of racial profiling that go on, um, you know, and racial profiling is not just, it's not just a male, uh, a person of color male, it's, it's people of color that are females as well mm -hmm. who are profiled, arrested, and often uh, victimized. Um, so, there are a lot of challenges that are 
today that are structural, and certainly racial profiling is, is one of them. Um, another one is, um, you know, as uh, African American people try to get ahead, because of their interface with the criminal justice system, often at a very early age, mm -hmm. um, if they go to apply for a job, they have challenges because so many um, organizations ask if you've ever been convicted of a crime. And so sometimes uh, people who are in the business of hiring will take those resumes and just, or those applications and just not hire anyone. So you have that kind of a vicious cycle that uh, people who, uh, people of color who are, you know, just as hardworking as anybody that's white and, and really want to get ahead and really want to um, uh, earn money and have a job are left out of the economic system. So um, there are a lot of structural issues and that's one of the things that our YWCA was involved with the Ban the Box campaign here. Which, which passed in Rochester. Yeah, which passed in Rochester on City Council. Can I ask a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, I filmed the testimonies when people were getting up and talking to City Council and I was there when they passed the vote and it was a really momentous occasion. It was mm -hmm. great. And I'm wondering if the YWCA or one of the organizations that like was pushing for that is doing any kind of monitoring and seeing in Rochester if employers are actually adhering to the, the ordinance. Do you yes. have any information about that? I don't have any information okay. about it per se. I know that um, part of what we do at the YWCA is try to bring the issue to different audiences. Mm -hmm. So I, um, what we've been doing is still continuing to have conversations about it. And that's really um, important because, for instance, there's this, um, uh, we have a program. Let me tell you about our, some of our other programs oh, yeah, yeah, at the YW. Um, we have, you know, Witnessing Whiteness, we do have workshops on it, which I'm going to be talking about um, this Saturday. But we also have a program called Person to Person. And what the person to person program does is it matches up people across race and ethnicity for a nine month um, experience and dialogue. And so um, you would apply to be part of person to person, you would be matched up with a person of a different race and ethnicity, and then you would go through a structured experience. And so the idea is not just to learn how to talk about race with someone who looks like you, mm -hmm. to learn how to talk about race across differences in race and ethnicity. And um, so people go through this nine month experience and it is structured, there's there's one-on-one -on -one experience with your, your partner. And then there's also what we call like group um, uh, conversations on issues around race and ethnicity. So the idea is building those relationships, building connection, because Rochester is such a segregated community that often if we don't, you know, we might see somebody on the street and say hello, but to actually engage in conversations about race and ethnicity and get to know each other's points of view, we just see the blasts on the media. You know, we don't really talk about this stuff. Right. So this is a way to really build skills uh, in talking about this. So in Witnessing Whiteness, we talk about building knowledge. And this is a, a you're facilitating a discussion called Witnessing Whiteness. Yes, Witnessing Whiteness is yeah. the discussion I'm facilitating, but we talk about three things, building skills, hmm. building knowledge, and building community. And so part of the other program, which is person to person, is really about those things as well. And building community, building community across race and ethnicity. And so when people are through with that program, the, um, the idea is that you're going to make a difference 
in your own sphere of influence, mm -hmm. okay? So if you're working at a company or an institution, one of the things that you could do is bring up the issue of what is the application process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, do we ask questions about um, criminal background mm -hmm. on the application? And if we do so, why do we do that? Um, you know, there are ways to um, look at people's background where it's important for a specific job mm -hmm to have, you know, a criminal background check and so on and so forth. But that shouldn't be the first thing that comes to mind when somebody comes in to apply for a job. So, you know, there's a whole process that goes on before you're actually hired. And if you're in a sensitive position, you know, working with, with children or people who are vulnerable or those, of course you're gonna do a background check. So it doesn't mean an employer can't do that. So. Um, but with, uh, with these other programs, person to person, what, um, what is happening with those is that as people become aware of opportunities to um, take what they've learned and, and develop um, a way of talking about it within their own uh, environment, whether it's work or church or community, there are opportunities for them to make a difference. Mm -hmm. you know, in their regular day-to-day -day life. And part of, part of the difference is structural. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the difference, honestly, is one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. It really is about talking to Uncle Joe, you know, <laughs> and talking to Grandma. Mm -hmm. And it's about family dinners and what comes up at the family dinner. And it's about, for me, I know that um, if I hear a comment that I think is a biased comment that has prejudice attached to it, in the past when I would hear something, my blood pressure would just rise. And I would think, I can't believe this person is saying that. I can't believe what I'm hearing. And I would become so overwhelmed that I could almost not talk. Yeah. So it's like you're hearing it, you feel like this goes against all the things that you believe in, but what do you say? You know, and sometimes what you're compelled to say is not something that you should say at all <laughs> because you're just so upset. Right. So part of it is learning how to stay in that space, learning how to calm yourself down, and learning how to speak from the heart to people that you know that you care about or even to people that you don't know. And learning how to engage that person, not in not attack them, mm -hmm. okay? How do we change this from an attack into a dialogue? Mm -hmm. How do we begin to have that dialogue without um, sending someone in the other direction? So that's a lot of the skill building that I would call and a lot of what we do in witnessing whiteness is about okay think of the last time that you were in that situation what would you have wanted to say some of the approaches are things you know when you when you all say things like that uh, you know it reminds me of when I used to think some of the same things mm -hmm. so identifying with people mm -hmm. but then you know, I got involved with this uh, organization or, you know, I read this article mm -hmm. and this is what I found out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not about changing the world. Yeah. It is about staying in the conversation. And even if you are able to just use one example mm -hmm. of something that happened to you um, or that you're aware of, that was happening that was very unfair, unjust. Mm -hmm. um, using that example to state the mm. conversation, <laughs> right. you know? It's about having the skills to stay in there. Mm -hmm. And that's such a challenging yeah. thing for many of us because 
you're thinking, oh, well, you know, they're old, they're of their time, <laughs> right. you know, never going to change their... And, you know, the other thing is sometimes it is true that you have to pick your battles, right. you know. So, um, but there are many, and that's, that's part of what we try to do with witnessing whiteness. Is like figure out how figure to engage. Figure out how, right to, how to engage, how, how to not engage, but also <laughs> yeah. mostly how do you have that conversation with someone who has obviously not had the same opportunities sure. that you have had to learn about um, some of the history. Mm -hmm. You know, things like, you know, uh, redlining and, you know, lack of uh, opportunities for loans for homes for people. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these issues that are so much a part of um, what structurally keeps um, people of color down in our community, mm -hmm. you know. One of the examples that I had was um, this woman was at a uh, baseball game in one of our suburbs. And um, it was the game, um, there was one young man who was in the game, it was like junior high, and one young man who was African American, who was, he was really a great runner. Mm -hmm. And he had really worked hard to get up his speed and to join the team. And here he is, you know, African-American in a very, very white suburban area. So he felt like he really had to be really good. Yeah. And um, so there was the game was going on and these, you know, young ladies were on the bleachers watching the game. And they're like 12, 13 years old. And... Um, this guy, let's, let, let's say his name is Rob, he's, he's zooming around, he's being like a great, you know, fantastic, really pulling the team through. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the girls says, wow, he's really fast, isn't he? And, and the other girl said to her, yeah, well, they're like that. They're all really good at sports. Uh, and so this adult woman is standing there going, I can't believe she's saying that. that. Yeah. Yeah. What do I say? So you could, you could, you were there. You could see this on her face, like. No, she was telling me the oh, story. She was telling me the story. Oh, she okay. was telling me the story, All and right. so one of the things that you could say in a situation like that is, how do you think Rob would feel if he heard you say that? Mm. Rob has really worked hard to pick up his speed, mm -hmm. to be as good as he is, mm -hmm. and the fact is that you're saying that it, it, you're, you're discounting all of the effort mm -hmm. that he put in to learning how to run the bases. So one, you know, that's another one of the strategies that comes from witnessing whiteness is, you know, reaching out to people from a feeling standpoint. How do you think that person would feel if they heard you say that? Right. You know, and kind of like have them reflect on that because often people are not even thinking about that. They're just kind of making a comment that they heard some from somebody else, maybe one of their parents or their aunts or their Uncle Joe, you know, and or so... Or another playmate. Or another playmate, right, right. you know, and so, you know, the, the woman that was telling the story was, was um, she was trying to figure out how, how does she even you know, she wasn't even really with these girls. She was just overhearing it. So what should she do? But there's all kinds of situations yeah. like that that people run into that, you know, they take you off guard because you might not even be, you know, you're not expecting that conversation, right. you know? So part of this is being prepared. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you work with other people and you, you build a sense of how to respond like just like this woman did um, then you're more prepared to really um, intervene and to have the conversation in a way that you know might not um, send the person in the other direction and shut down um, I'm just curious the witness um, whiteness uh, breakout session um, 
like who's the audience for that? Is it white people? Is it is it people of color? Like, well, that's a really good question because um, we actually offer at the YW a series of workshops on the book Witnessing Whiteness. And when we originally when we started doing this, we were like, do we want people of color, mm -hmm. or is this just for white people? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that it's for both. Okay. Um, some organizations do it as a separate stream for white people, but in my book, I think that we need to build our skills at having these conversations mm -hmm. across racial and ethnic lines. And I know from my own experience doing the workshop that um, usually there's more white people. I'd say 75% of the people who participate were white, mm -hmm. maybe 25% people of color, okay. but we all learn from each other, sure. you know? And so um, there is an interest in these workshops, both by white people and people of color in learning more about witnessing whiteness. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's open. Okay, cool. Um, and then the, I don't know if you want to read this or just tell me like, do you, when is the, <laughs> the summit or? Yes, the the summit is um, this Saturday. Is it this Saturday? No, no it's, uh, it's a week from Saturday. A week from Saturday, yeah. Uh, September 26th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it is at Wilson Foundation Academy. And uh, we, we are really just thrilled and, um, you know, just excited to be there and to be participating with so many um, just incredible community people that are coming together uh, to talk about uh, race and pulling down racial barriers. And there are 12 breakout sessions, is that correct? Yes, there are. So there is quite a variety. Yeah. Um, there's a website. Yeah, please. www.faceracerock.org. And uh, you can go online and take a look at that. And uh, sign up, register. And my last question is why, and this is probably the biggest question, we've got like two minutes, so, you know, go where you want with it, but why is this conference important? Why should people come out? Well, this is really important for us as a community because if we are not able to address these issues um, as a community, we are not going to grow and develop. So it's one thing to grow and develop as an individual and it is one person at a time is the way that change works. So it doesn't happen by passing a law, although laws are important. It is one person, one relationship at a time. And that's why it's important for people to become engaged in this. And our community really needs to address this issue if we're going to survive and thrive as a community. So, yeah. Jean Carroll, thank you so much for your time today. This is great. You're welcome.